and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Faith Camp. And uh, this morning we have something really exciting to, show with, to share with you guys. Um, so we've been working on this project for about a year and a half. 30 years. <laughs> 30 years. No, a year and a half almost. And um, this is not the first episode that we're going to show today. We're going to show episode four because episode one and two are already out on our website. Um, the episode two came out last night at 6 p.m. and episode one came out the week before last. But how did it get started? You can find them by going to missiontrek.net. Yeah. yeah. So, well, um, oh man, it must have been 2012. I got a call from uh, Brenda Walsh and she's doing the Three Beans Kids Network and she was asking for shows for her network. And I said, well, if we do it, kids show for 3ABN Kids Network. It has to be missions, about missions. And so um, she says, okay. So I was thinking originally that we could do a show where we go and interview kids in the mission field. But by the time we got to the point where we were ready to go do the show, what was wrong? There were no kids in the mission field. Yeah. So um, we kind of changed the approach or the focus. So we followed Lillianne and Marianne, my sister, around Thailand and documented their experiences, um, seeing what the food is like and what living there is like and what it's like to be a missionary there. So this episode is, yeah. Yeah, so this is the fourth episode. For the first episode, we went to... It shows us traveling there. We went to China and then our first day in Bangkok, first <laughs> Sabbath there. Yeah. And yeah. Then the second show. Do you remember? I, <laughs> the, I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what it's about. <laughs> so uh, the floating market. Yeah. And then we interviewed a special missionary. Who's <laughs> here among us right now? Yep. But we couldn't show her face. Could no. We? So that was kind of interesting, huh? It was interesting for a first interview too. Like that was the first interview Marianne and I had ever done. So. And it wasn't even your typical interview, so. Yeah, it's it like, like the camera was behind the person they were interviewing and showing Marianne and Lillian the entire time. And you remember where we shot it? On the roof yeah. of our hotel in and Bangkok. there was construction behind it. Yeah. There was construction, <laughs> yep, it was great. It was and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, do you remember what's being shown in this program? Okay, so here's <laughs> what happens. When we go out and shoot a show, that's only a part of actually making the show, shooting it. Yeah, so we have to come back and we build a whole set in our garage and shot another, like, shot 13 shows uh -huh. in our garage. So, like, the footage we shot over there is not used, is not the whole show. Right. We had to shoot more in the studio and... Right. So. In the process well, of editing it all together. Yeah. Voiceover, script writing for all that, and... Yeah. Yeah. So, you haven't... Have you seen four? Have you seen episode four? Not that it's been, since Ooh. it's been completed. Oh, so, so, yeah, nobody's really seen these, this one yet, so yeah. it hasn't come out yet, so. So this is uh, going to be exciting. Um, why Mission Trek? Why that name? Because, you know, like sometimes when you talk to people, they, they don't understand that, you know, it's really not that scary to go overseas. Uh -huh. To go to Thailand, you know, it's like, it's a foreign country, you don't know what's over there, you know what the food is like. So we wanted, to show, we wanted to make this show so that people could see how fun and, and cool and exciting it is to go over there and how easy it is to travel overseas. Right. So, and to yeah. inspire each person that watched it to have their own mission trek, their own experience, their own journey, make yeah. it their own. Yeah. Right, awesome. So you'll notice that, um, oh, who's, who's the producer here? Yeah. James. Yeah. But he's too young. <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> He's too young, right? Wait, I, I have nobody on my side. What's this one? <laughs> yeah. Did you feel like you were too young? I felt inexperienced. Inexperienced. I what I was doing. <laughs> it's like planning a 13-part series. We thought we were going to only do five shows. Yeah, that was my idea. That was his idea, and I wanted to do five. seven. The reason but, I wanted to do five is that I did the I Want the City. I shot... It took me nine, and a half, nine months to shoot the series and three years to edit the series. So I was thinking, man, if they can do five shows, 
that's great. And James is like, no, Dad, we can do seven. I'm like, oh, don't yeah. do seven. We did 13. Yeah. God still had bigger plans. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. So we're very thankful to people like in yeah. the Philippines that edited and, and people that helped Jonathan and Hannah. Yes. Yep. And Jonathan and Mark in the Philippines and all the other editors that we had, John Ramirez. Yes. And Bindu and everybody that helped with the show. Very thankful to them. But, yeah. yeah. So um, after we play this episode, then they're going to have a question and answer time. And so if you can think of the hardest question to ask these kids, <laughs> hey, sorry. I use the word kids, I apologize. Um, these persons. <laughs> we'll have some time. Yeah. So enjoy. And Thank you. We've grown up in the church and have always been somewhat involved in outreach. But how can we get involved in missions overseas? My name is Marianne. And I'm Lillian. We wanted to find out. Join us on our journey to discover the culture, the lifestyle, the need, and the mission in two of Southeast Asia's least reached countries. Welcome to Mission Trek. Welcome back to Mission Trek. We're so excited that you could join us again. Last week, we left Bangkok and traveled north up to Chiang Mai, where we met the JFA media team. This week, we're going to travel even further north to Chiang Rai, which is near the border of Myanmar, which used to be known as Burma. We are going to see a very popular tourist destination, Wat Rong Khun, which means the White Temple. It's a very beautiful place. And even though it's meant to be a tourist attraction, it gives us a lot of insights into how the people over there see life. They have a worldview that is very different from ours. We looked at pictures trying to decide whether we should come here or not, and we're like, oh, that looks really, really pretty and really cool, we should go. When we got here, we're like, oh wow, the pictures, they didn't do it justice at all. This temple was actually made by an artist, not, not like a priest or anything. It was an artist who, this is their interpretation of like heaven and hell. Yeah, it's got like white and then like silver outlines and stuff. You can notice on this on the sidewalk, there's like looks like imprints of flames and and those kind of hands and kind of creepy, but. This part is the hell, I guess. Yeah. The temple is heaven. So. On the way here, we um, kind of had like a season of prayer and singing songs and claim promises because, like, this is a place of devil worship. We just want to make sure that we're protected. This place is. Really, actually incredible. It's kind of like a work of art. It's easy to sense that there is strong satanic influence in this place. You can almost feel the fear and supposed sacredness that the people have for this temple. This building is actually the bathrooms. They are painted gold because the artist wanted to demonstrate that the treasures of this world won't last. What we think is highly valuable really isn't. There were these good luck charms that were for sale. People were buying them to help ward off the evil spirits. It's so sad because they have no idea that those meaningless pieces of metal can do nothing to help protect them. They have a whole different worldview than we do because like, they are probably constantly in fear of offending the spirits and all this stuff like on and on and on. And, if they get sick, then it's because they didn't do something right or all this stuff. So you know, they're like constantly have to try to work hard to be good. I think the gospel would be valuable here, but I think it'd be a bit challenged to teach them. So we're not allowed to take any pictures or film in there. I guess because it's sacred and they don't. I'm not really sure. <laughs> anyway, you're not supposed to. We just came out.
out of the white temple and inside there was um, a Buddha that was all gold and there was a monk, a monk sitting in front of it like I swear he was not real but apparently we didn't he like was. we didn't even see him breathe he didn't blink but he was definitely real uh -huh. and it was kind of creepy like there are paintings all over the walls of like Big awesome. eye. Yeah, yeah. What kind it of? Was, what did you see in the painting? It was. It was kind of strange. Like we said, there's like an artist interpretation, but like it was a city skyline, and then like there was like the devil, and then there was Superman, and minions, and like a whole bunch of different weird action figures. We leave with questions in our mind. Um, it was interesting. It's definitely an experience. That was so intense. Yeah. The most shocking part was all the people riding in hell with guards to protect the entrance to heaven. Yeah, and it seemed like it was up to the individual to work their way to get to heaven. There was no savior reaching out to help. Mm-hmm. Ellen White says that the difference between true religion and false religion is that false religion is based on the idea that you can work your way to heaven by yourself, mm -hmm. whereas we believe that salvation is a free gift that's offered to everybody. It's really difficult to claim this free gift because it means that we have to put away our pride. But so many people have never even heard that this free gift is even out there. Yeah. The real beauty of the character of Christ is seen in the life of the believer. And that's why it's so important for believers to go live among unbelievers. Yeah. So that they can see Jesus. But back to the story, our next goal was to visit the Sharon family. They live west of Chiang Mai and are a family that is reaching out to the local villages with health and healing. Yeah, but to get there, James, our producer, wanted to explore a different way. Which was fine with us because we were all really tired of buses. <laughs> yeah. We bought a couple of used motorbikes to do the Mehong song loop. Mm -hmm. We found out later that it should have taken us three days, but since we wanted to see Mr. Leroy teaching in one of the refugee camps, we had to do the whole 270 mile loop in two days. Yeah, that was pretty crazy. And the roads were really windy. They were. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the first day we made it to Pai, which was about 80 miles into the trip. Mm -hmm. And we spent the night in some really cool bamboo houses. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. It was. Yeah. The next day, though, was really hard because we had to travel 210 miles in just over 12 hours. We finally got to the Sharon's house. It was really late at night, and we were so tired. Mm -hmm. We're about to head out on the Mei Hong Song loop. We've just kind of gotten out of Chiang Mai. And so we're going to stop and get something to eat. We stopped at this cute little roadside shop. The food was really good. I think we made the right, picked the right place to stop. Now we're about to head out. We're gonna. It's about two and a half hours to our destination. It's a city called Pai. So we're gonna spend the night there, but we have to get there first. <laughs> so it's supposed to be really curvy between here and there. So we're gonna see how this goes. <laughs> The northern part of Thailand is mostly untouched by the gospel. As far as we know, we did not pass any missionaries on the whole loop. It's going good so far. Like The corners are getting a lot sharper, so we've had some 180s. So more what we were expecting. So we just came around this corner and there's like this huge black snake that was like across one whole lane. And when we went past it, its head went up and it was a cobra. And so. then we went past it and it was like maybe this far from like our legs 
and we're not wearing like long pants, so yeah. Um, it's a little bit freaky. This is huge snake, like I don't know, maybe five feet. I'm frustrated at the truck driver. This truck driver stopped and waited for the snake to get out of the way before it went on. Like she just wants the truck driver to kill it. <laughs> so now I've seen a cobra. Very and close. Like, very close. Really close. <laughs> got to Pi, took us about a half hour to find a place to stay, like everything was full. It's this cute little place with like bungalows. So we're about to go to bed. Looking forward to sleeping well. We have a lot of riding tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So we had breakfast this morning and then we hit the road and we're heading it all the way to Mesa Yang, which is like 200 miles. So we're gonna be pretty sore by the end of it. As we ride today, we'll be going through like lots of mountains and there'll be lots of hill tribes that we go through their territory. There's the Karen, the Mong, Mian, the Aka, and Lisu. Lisu. Yeah. But it's really pretty. There's awesome views, lots of mountains. Just gotta keep riding. And we saw a sign that said Lisu Lodge. So this is actually a Lisu village. I've never seen a Lisu village before, so this is cool how like the village is built just on like the side of the mountain. So the villages I've been in are more like in the valley, so it's cool. This is my shift lever, and it's supposed to go on right down there. It's stuck in first. You're trying to decide what to do. The closest town on the map is like 44 kilometers away. Thankfully, a native came and stopped and asked what was wrong, and so he's like, follow me. So I think we're at a school, and he's helping get the bike fixed. That was so much fun. It really was. At the end though, it started to get a little more challenging. We had to travel the last few hours after dark and the road was steep and it was cold. And then my dad's shift lever broke again. Yeah, but this time it was in second gear, which made it really hard to get up the last few hills. Yeah. You guys even had to use your legs to try and make it to the top. Yeah, that was really challenging. But thankfully, even though we had some issues along the way, it still didn't slow us down very long overall. Mm -hmm. It was a miracle, really. It was, it was. Yeah. So we ended up arriving at the Sharon's house around 10 o'clock at night, and we had to get up at 5 the next morning and ride three more hours to see Mr. Sharon at the Miramu refugee camp. That was crazy. Mm -hmm. It was so hard to get up and go ride again the next morning. Yeah. But when you're in the mission field, you have to be willing to do things for the gospel's sake. Yeah. But we did get to hear an amazing story about how God's truth can reach lives. The Sharon family moved to Thailand nine years ago, and they have done ministry in many different ways, including teaching English, training local missionaries, and taking care of unwanted children. A few years ago, when they had to close their school and move because of new laws, they were praying about where to go, and there was a village that wanted them to come and teach English and the Bible too. A couple years ago, Lisa told the story of the property and how they built their house. When we moved here, they offered us this land, but we didn't know <laughs> that people had been killed on this place, and so it was cursed. And so anybody who stayed here should have died. And so simply living here is a witness to the village. And 
you know, they, everybody in every village in this whole area knows about it. <laughs> Here we are, we're still alive. The only stipulation was the government said that we had to build permanent buildings. They didn't want bamboo buildings anymore. We had to move 20 dump truck loads of dirt out of the mountain in order to get started. We did this all by hand with just a hoe in our backs and little tiny buckets. Um, so that took us a while. <laughs> it was really cool because when we first started digging, we had nothing in the bank account for this project. Nothing. And as we dug, it, I mean, we didn't get money while we were digging, but as soon as it was time to pour the foundation, money came in for the foundation. And as soon as we needed to start the walls, money came in for the walls. And so each step of the way, we've gotten just exactly what we needed to keep going. He's currently teaching a class by using the Bible to teach them English. So we're here just to learn about, kind of more about what he does and what life is like in refugee camp. As though they had been waiting ages and ages. What is ages? Ages, long, long time. Ages and ages. We're still at the refugee camp. We just talked to the principal of the school here. Um, it's actually a junior college. And he told us a little bit about the camp. It was founded in 1985. They can't actually leave the camp because they're refugees from Burma. It's really hard for them to get any education. They really aren't really allowed to work outside of the camp, so they don't have any money really. So it's really good that they have a school here. As we watched Mr. Sharon teach English, we were impressed by his enthusiasm and commitment. He uses Uncle Arthur's My Bible Friends to teach English along with Bible stories. We could tell he loves sharing the truth in this simple way. So we asked him to tell us about his experience while teaching in the refugee camp. Um, I lay down right here about maybe 45 minutes during the day to rest. Other work. All the other time I'm speaking, or I'm walking and greeting people, or I'm in their house, I'm eating with them, I'm all the rest of the time. When I'm standing in front of the class, talking, half preaching, but talking, that is sowing seeds. Teaching the children, the students to learn on their own. I'm teaching them they can read on their own. They can understand on their own. Just across from here, I sat in the Baptist worship service. I didn't say anything. I, I can't understand anything, but they like it that I'm there, right? I'm foreigner, I'm kind of an attraction. But after the worship service, the head elder who is in charge of it, he wants to talk about religion, theology with me. Well, how can we do that, right? But there's one girl that can speak English. She's a Baptist. She can speak to me. So, I said, okay, if you want to, <laughs> want to talk religion. So he begins to talk about the Sabbath. Well, you know, I didn't really want to start with that, but he wanted to talk about it. So we, I begin to share about the Sabbath. I have to speak to her. She speaks to him. He then speaks to her. She speaks to me, right? So it's going back and forth. And she's listening to him? Really? Oh, so she tells me, she listens to me. Really? I never knew that. So then she tells him. <laughs> so this girl is able to hear both sides of it. And she's the one relaying the message. And I know she's relaying it correctly. And then, you know, all the excuses are coming. 
so I'm thinking, you know, this is going to go nowhere because I can't speak their language. So God prompted me, ask them, who is your God? Who is your God? So I told the girl, I said, ask the head elder, who is your God? So she asked him, and he goes, hmm, you thinking about that? And I said, well, if God is your God, believe the Bible. Believe what the Bible says. But if you are God, you decide. You decide what you believe. If your church is God, follow them. If I am God, follow me. But don't follow me. I'm not God. That man got it. He's thinking about that. <gasps> he then begins to talk to about 20 people, maybe as many as 30 people in the room that had been listening. <laughs> he begins to talk to them in Korean. I don't know what he's saying. The little girl, her eyes got really big. She goes, oh, he's saying that you're right. He's telling the people everything that you just told us. Wow. Yeah. You don't get pictures of stuff like that. That is what God is doing. Doesn't happen very often. Not very often. Once in a while. And if you bring the camera, <laughs> it usually spoils it. Yeah. But I was amazed. He talked for a while. I can't say nothing because I don't know what he's talking about. Then everybody stopped talking and we began to eat and talk about normal things, right? God planted lots of seeds that I could not have planted. That story was so moving. Yeah, Mr. Sharon is so on fire about the work that God is doing there. He says there are so many opportunities to share the three angels' message that he can't fill them all. So he's praying for more volunteers to come and reach the other villages and refugee camps up there. Yeah, so while we were at the refugee camp, mm -hmm. back at the Sharon's house, a group of local villagers came, and one lady had been having seizures and fainting spells. She'd even been to the hospital without any relief. Yeah. Years ago, in 1993, I went to Russia and it changed my life. But you know, there was like tons of people that went over there at the same time I did and it doesn't change everybody. But if you, if you really want something better and you're asking God to change you, a short term mission trip can change your life. Villagers often come to the Sharon's house seeking medical care, even though Mrs. Sharon is only an EMT and has limited resources. I'm not a doctor. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I mean, I can just pray about it. I'm praying and ideas come to my mind, but when it's that serious, it's like she's having seizures. She's, she can't walk half the time. So the hospitals can't help her. They give her barbiturates, but... <sighs> I just wish I could help them. <laughs> I'm sorry. She definitely has a circulation problem. She's extremely anemic. She's bleeding internally. And... So the only thing I can think of doing is I gave her tea to stop the bleeding internally and I'm giving her whole grain rice so that hopefully it'll get her bowels moving more regularly because she's really constipated also and lots of tea and lots of water and vitamins to help with the anemia. Um, but unless I can stop the bleeding, I don't think you can stop the anemia. I don't know enough to know what I'm doing, but I this is what came to my mind. And I know God gives me ideas. So do you get groups like this very often? Yeah. 
whenever I go to the village. Usually people start gathering and it's all so big. It's like things that I don't know how to do. I'm just an EMT. I'm supposed to take them to a hospital, you know. I'm not supposed to have to treat them. <laughs> but God has given me a lot of resources. I have natural remedies books. <laughs> so I go to those whenever I can. But like in this, I'm going to have to study and try to figure out all these things before I go back and, and see if there's anything else I can be doing. You know, when they're just villagers, it's easier because then you don't really think of them personally. But I ask God to give me love for them, and I do. I just, I love them so much, and I don't want them to be hurting with no help. I mean, if I'm the best they have, that's pretty bad. <laughs> but anyway, I'm thankful that I have what I do. I'm not, I'm not unthankful. It's just that I wish I knew more. Would a nurse be helpful? A nurse would be awesome. <laughs> the head woman has been begging for a nurse. I've been asking people, but it always falls through. So the only thing is, is it got to be a special nurse. If it's just somebody who's going to give them drugs, that's not going to help them. I want them to be able to to get well and to know what's what they're doing in their lifestyle that's causing them problems. And so I try to not give them any drugs unless I have to. Usually I just use herbs and things that, or especially stuff that they can do themselves. I wish I had the gift of tongues so I could speak to them myself. Translation, Translation. thing was just almost impossible to deal with. Yeah. I mean, I don't know for sure that she's even hearing what I'm saying. Hmm. So... That's why young people are important, because us old folks, <laughs> we can't learn languages very easily, but young people can. So I'm praying for young people who are really, really dedicated. inspiring what God is doing there. Mrs. Sharon had prayed for God to give her a love for the people, and He's answering that. Yeah, and we each should pray to have that love for the unreached put in our hearts so that we are willing to work for Him in the future. Yeah, but no matter where you are, you can do something. For example, last Christmas, we had the opportunity to go make gift boxes and hand them out to the refugee children in our local area. There's plenty for everybody to do. But the point is that each of us can be the hands and feet of Jesus no matter where we are. See you next time on Mission Trek. And please remember to pray for the unreached. <laughs>